Praise God. That's hard to follow. <laughs> Praise God. Has he been a good God this week? He's been a good God this week before the week ever starts, hasn't he? All the time. Praise the Lord. I won't take too much time tonight. All right, three hours. <laughs> Praise God. Let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we just give you praise and glory today, God. We, Lord, with our, our free will, God, we, we speak and we sing praises unto you. You are our Lord, and we love you. Lord, we love you. We love you so much. You are our strength. And you are our comforter. You are the lifter of our head. Father, you have all knowledge. You have all wisdom. You're an all-knowing God. I pray that you would give out knowledge Give out wisdom, bring understanding to us, your people, and strengthen us. And we will give all the glory unto you. In Jesus' name, we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Say, Lord, give me knowledge, give me wisdom, give me understanding. Amen. I always want understanding, amen? You know, knowledge don't do you any good if you don't understand it. Have you ever had instructions for something and you were looking at it and you said, I still don't know how to use this? Huh? <laughs> Isn't that funny? You can have all the, you can have a book in your hand and it says product manual. That means everything about that device is in there. Every function, how to do it, everything. You can have it, you can read it, and then you can still not know how to operate the device. Amen? And then you go uh, call some technician or service tech or somebody that's technically capable and they come in there and they just, you know, just operate the thing. And you're like, I don't even know what they're doing. Well, what do they have? Understanding. Amen. They have knowledge, but they understand the knowledge. Amen. This, oh, you know, it's the thing with iPads. You can't. Can I use this? This is a manual for life. Amen. Amen. Every answer. Isn't that amazing? There are products that came out five, ten years ago that now they're just, they're obsolete. You know? This thing has always been, and it doesn't change. It's consistent. It's still valid, and it always will be. Amen. Isn't that amazing? There is not a product that is on this earth that can even say that. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Why, why? Because there's always something better they can do with it. There's nothing better you can do. Amen. It's the best as ever will be. It's perfect. Amen? Amen? And what we need, we can read it. You ever read it and not understood it? You're reading knowledge. That's why it says with all our getting, get understanding. Amen? Um, <clears throat> we are talking about kingdom of servant kings um, <clears throat> we are on part 
four of this message. And we've been, seems like every service we have a, a few that weren't here the last time, so I have to do some review. Because I hate, like I said, I hate to leave anybody out. I want you to, to underst understand this. It's power. Um, only in God's kingdom do you see a king, kings, leaders, but they're also servants. Servants, not as in scrubbing floors and that kind of a servant, but serving others. We serve people with our gifts. We serve people with our time. We serve people with our love. Amen? Um, <clears throat> Jesus was the perfect example because when he came, what did he do? What did he do to the, to the disciples? Wash your feet. Can you see the Queen of England coming over here and wanting to wash your feet? I don't want to speak for her, but, you know, there are those around her that may say if they decided to come here, they'd say, can, can we sit up in the balcony? <laughs> and they, they'd want to go up there in the balcony, wouldn't they? A high, lofty place away from the people to protect her and because she is a, a symbol, a status. Uh, she, you know, there's a lot to her. She's a symbol for that country. You would never see her coming and washing the feet. Huh? Jesus, king of the universe, came and did just that. I don't know why sometimes we think that we can't serve other people. We're afraid that well, they'll look down on me. They'll think, you know, it, there's this pride thing. Pride can get in the way. Amen? I find the character that Jesus as a man had absolutely amazing to be king of all glory the ancient king the one who laid the foundation of the earth if you make something if somebody comes in your house and tries to have authority they just bust in and try to have authority in your house, would that not make you mad? Hmm? You're sitting there and all of a sudden there's a knock at the door and you open it up, they don't even say, hey, they just say, excuse me, using your bathroom. What would y'all do? Hmm? Y'all might have to call Pastor Jeanette and say, oh, I've messed up. <laughs> this man barged in my house and I beat him all the way out into the front yard. And I said some things I shouldn't have said. I'm not saying if somebody comes to your house, well, Nathan said that I shouldn't do that. I'm just going, no. But Jesus laid the foundation of the world is what the Bible says, Amen. And then he comes here in his own what? Hmm? Huh? His own fors forsook him, didn't they? They didn't uphold him as the king of glory. Amen? What do we do sometimes? We, we, if we feel like we are in a certain seen in a certain way. We want other people to see us in that certain way. We're not happy knowing who we are. 
We let other people's view of us define who we are instead of knowing that God has defined us and we should just be what he has made us. That's what keeps us from becoming who we are is because we keep thinking we have to get other people on board. You know what I love about Joseph? He saw a dream. His brothers were jealous of him. He didn't care what they thought. He said, I saw the moon. I saw my brothers, my family bowing down to me. I used to question that scripture a lot because I didn't understand it and I thought maybe it was, was wrong, but I realized that it wasn't wrong. When you know who you are, you've got to speak what you believe. And you're telling people what you believe not so that they can agree with you and let that define you. You're telling them so that when you do become who you are, they'll know that you always knew who you were before you became what you are. Like Joyce Myers. Perfect example. She said Joyce Myers said that she was, I'm going to preach to thousands and people used to laugh at her. Look at her now. I was just watching a video the other day with uh, Carrie Job was at her church and she said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, Carrie Job, and they've got a screen. It's like a movie screen back there. But, I mean, it looked like a concert, so many people. When you believe something, you need to be able to speak what you believe. And you remember that you're not telling people so that they can line up with what you believe because most of the time they're not. But you have to be so rooted knowing who you are. The Bible says that after he said this, his father kept it in his mind what his son had said. Did it come to pass? Absolutely. Did he let any of the things happen to him change where he was going? No. Nothing changed where he was going. This ain't even in my message, but I feel like the Lord is just directing me this way. He saw a dream. He saw a vision of where he was going. It didn't matter that his brothers didn't believe him. It didn't matter that the people that were his family sold him, thought about killing him. It didn't matter that he was falsely accused By his manager, manager's wife. And you know what's so funny about Potiphar is the Bible says that he saw that the Lord was with him. Can I tell you that sometimes people may see that the Lord is with you. but it doesn't always stop them from doing things they shouldn't do. Have you ever thought about that? It says Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him. But it just took his wife, who was trying to run around on Potiphar, and caught him in the house, and he was thrown into jail. But that didn't stop him from becoming who he was going to be. He had two people that were very close to the the king who he used his gift for. And then they forgot about him. Well, one of them was killed. But the other one forgot about him until two years later when his gift would help him. Then he remembered, oh, wait a minute, somebody's gift will help me. Now I will remember. 
That's an important thing to remember because no matter what your gift is, most people follow you for your gift. Not you. There are very few people in my life that that are just genuine friends. Because I feel like they would take a bullet for me. I feel like when I'm around them, they're not around me to, to get something from me. They want to share with me. I love that. I love real people. Amen? And it doesn't mean anything bad about other people. You're, a lot of times you're just, you don't have that attachment with people. You don't really know them that well. And it's all right that, you know, I don't know Benny Hinn. I enjoy his gift. I don't know T.D. Jakes. I've never met him in my life. But I enjoy his gift. And it's his gift that God gave him that serves me and exhorts me and gives me knowledge. And you know what let, lets me know? That my gift is not for me. It's for other people. Your gift is for other people. So when you're not letting God use you, you're robbing other people. I don't want to rob other people. Amen? I, I used to struggle... Do y'all realize that, was there ever a time in your life when you thought, man, preachers or pastors or singers or any of these people that you think are really anointing, you, you thought, man, they, everything must be perfect in their life. At any time? There was a time where I thought, I, I knew there was some, some people that had issues, but I thought, Man, as big as those things are with Benny Hinn, ain't no way. The Holy Spirit probably draws the sheets back every morning for him. But then he went through a time with his wife. And I went through a, a time where, you know, and, and I've talked to Roy about these kinds of things before because you know sometimes you get up to preach and you, you, you've got the word that God's given you and it, 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 there's just you, nobody knows what's going on with you there's other people that you come in here and you may shake hands with and you never know what they're going through and they may sing, they may talk with you, they may encourage you, and you never know, even though they've encouraged you, and you say, man, that, that was such a good thing they did, and you don't know that they're battling something. Do you realize that everybody is fighting a battle of some kind? We know the ones that we know, but there's so many that we don't know. I love that my gift is for other people. And I love that God uses me not to bless me. He uses me to bless other people. And I'm blessed because of it, because I'm making my father proud. I don't want to get on my Father's Day message for, for that night. I love making my daddy proud. It feels good to make him proud. Amen? Amen. I remember Roy one time, he was, said he had been busy all week just with everything going on with ministry. And, you know, sometimes you have a lot of people, you've got to go visit in the hospital and you've got people calling you on the phone. And, but that doesn't mean that you're, uh, that you don't need that time with God. You need that alone time with God, that study time. Sometimes you can be doing ministry and you've never had that alone time. Can you believe can you, believe you can be so busy? You ever been that way? And I remember Roy had said, uh, 
he said he had to preach and he he had a message, but he didn't have the time to pray and to prepare for it like he was wanting to. And he said he asked God, he said, Lord, can you give me this one on credit? Y'all remember that? You know what the good thing is, is every time I have to teach, I have to preach, any battle, if I am going through one or if there's things going on or anything, the enemy, does he not? He'll try to use things going on in your life. Oh, man, you won't be as anointed today because you've been so busy. Or you won't be this because of, uh, of this. You know, he will put anything on you. You held your horn down for 20 seconds behind that guy that pulled out in front of you. Ain't nothing going to happen. <laughs> I love that God is the one that does what he does through us. Amen? Think about Judas. Did Judas ever go out and heal people and lay hands on people? He did. Did God know who Judas was? Now, at that point, his heart had not been completely gone, where he was able to have the gifts be put upon him for who? For the people. Amen? That's why I never let, if I give out a message, if I interpret a message, if I pray for people, if I, you know, none of that determines whether I'm in the right place with God or not. You know, there are some people who will, they'll be out of church for a, a while or get away and then they'll come and then they'll shout and they'll say, yes, I am still saved. And then they'll leave and not be back for a long time. They base their salvation on experiences. And if every time they come, they have an experience, they think everything's all right. Judas walked with Jesus everywhere. But it didn't determine who he really was. He finally sold himself over, didn't he? And then he regretted it. Amen? It is so important. You know, we're talking about kingdom of servant kings. And in the last part, and in this part, I'm focusing on character. Who are you? Who are you? If we ask people at church who you are, would it be different than what someone at your work would say who you are? Are we supposed to be like him? I mentioned this last time, but I think it's such an important thing. He's, the Bible says he's the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. Are we? We're not perfect. But we at least need to know who we are and be working on shedding everything that is not who we are. I'm working on Tyler with this right now because he's in an environment at school and he says that those kids, he says, they cuss all the time. And I know they do because I was there one time. When you guys were in school, because I, I, this is something that I'm not very, uh, I'm not very aware of uh, if, if there's a, a large generational gap with this kind of issue. But when you were in 6th, 7th, 8th grade, did kids cuss? 
No? Yes? No? Yes? No? No? Yes? Huh? <laughs> you ain't that old? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Becky, where, where did, what state did you live in when you were in 6th, 7th, 8th grade? Mm-hmm. You were in South Carolina. You were in South Carolina. I was curious if it maybe was a... Texas. Did they cuss? So you can see that there is a cultural change. Amen? Now, I'm sure there were people that did, but for the most part, it seems like years ago, especially when I I remember talking to my grandmother and my grandfather, everybody seemed, there was a period where it seemed like everybody was afraid to go to hell. (laughs) And they had a reverence for God. Now we have people who there is no, nothing is sanctified to them. Anything is game. I drill Tyler all the time because I don't want to just turn a blind eye and say, oh, he's being good. I want to know I've got 18 years to be an influence and I want to shape and mold his character. Amen? He's got a phone and somebody, uh, where's Hope? Hey. He had a a kid that had uh, said a cuss word on his phone, texted him. And I prayed about it because anybody know who Marilyn Manson is? Demonic guy. He's a deacon in the Church of Satan. He's just really far out there. He went to Christian school growing up. Catholic school, high school. I don't want to close Tyler up so much to where he doesn't realize that there's things out there. I know the world and what's going to be out there. I want to prepare him for it and let him know, hey, son, this stuff exists, but that's not our culture. We're from a different place. I want him to be a leader. And so I talked to him about it. And we began having a discussion about culture and about character and making sure that no matter what anybody else does, Don't let them define you and you think that in order to be in with them, you have to permeate their culture. We're kingdom people. This was a couple months ago. Uh, Then last week he had a, I looked on his phone and uh, I actually have, all of his texts that come on his phone, they they come to, to my iPad. And I was looking through there and this boy had sent him a picture of him f- flipping him off. And I thought, you know, when I seen it, I'm sitting there going, I rebuke this devil in the name of Jesus. You want to reach through there, you know. And all the while, I'm still keeping in mind that this is a lost kid and most likely it's his parents' fault. And I looked on down through there and Tyler talks to him about church, going to church, having a fish fry. He's talking about church and I thought, good. He's not trying to hide anything. He's... Nothing. Hopefully he's being an influence to him. And I get on down and the kid says, what I 
what most of us usually think is like the worst of the curse words to him. And he's in sixth grade. And at first I'm just kind of shocked. And then I'm thinking, I know when I was in sixth grade, I know kids talked like that. But there is no way in the world that we were dumb enough to put it in writing where it could be used as evidence. Right? I said, Tyler, come in here. And everything Tyler talked about, the kid was just like putting down, putting down. And I realized that the boy probably doesn't have any good upbringing. I see that every time I see a child that is born to somebody not in church. Man, it gets me hungry to get these people in church when they have kids. I uh, I began to t- talk with him. I said, son, you don't seem, do you think this kid's cool? And he said, well, yeah, I, I, sort of. I said, he's not. I said, he uses this language because of where he is right now intellectually. Most people in the business world will say that people who use curse words a lot, even unsaved people, they always see them as unintelligent. It's true. Even people who are not saved in the business world that are smart people, when they are around somebody and they say that they cuss a lot, they look at that as a sign of intelligence because that's the only thing they know. I said, Tyler, I'm not trying to put everything around this this, this, this cursing thing, but it, what it is is it's a symptom that there's something wrong. This was a, this kid practices using this. And he's in sixth grade. I wrote him. I said, you know what? I, I just, at this point, I'm going to have to. I said, I said, uh, his name, Tyler does not use this language. He does not use these gestures. We go to church, and that is not something that we do. And I, I cannot control what you do at school around him. But I will tell you that this stuff will not come to this phone anymore. And if it does, I will go to the school, and I will find out who your parents are, and I will talk to them. And I sent it, and I asked him, uh, I asked Tyler the next day, I said, did he say anything? He said, well, no, he doesn't have his phone. He, uh, his parents took it away because he cussed the teacher out. I said, why are you hanging around this boy? I said, I try to leave it to you to have good judgment. And I want you to be an influence, but when I see that other people are being an influence, do you not... I've drilled him. Is this come out of your mouth? Have you, I mean, everything, because I want to know. He's 11. I only have a few years. And now is the time to really shape his culture. He didn't know that his texts come to my phone. I see every one of them. And I looked through all of them. Even when he's cleared everything out, I have everything in my house monitored. Every single website that has gone to, it is monitored, it is recorded. Why? I'm not trying to put bars on the window. I'm trying to make sure that the kingdom is present in my house. Who are we? Are we? If there is anything in your life, your private life, that you try to hide from other people, it shows that there is a lack of character somewhere. 
my life, I want it to be able to be exposed. I'm not talking about removing all privacy. I'm just saying there shouldn't be things in our life that we feel like we have to hide. Amen? If somebody's going to come to my house, I, there shouldn't be magazines that I feel like I've got to get out of the house in case they see them. Because they don't think I read this kind of stuff. <laughs> I remember uh, a guy that uh, used to work at our front desk when I first went over to our main warehouse and he used to be a preacher and he, he went to church and he was, man, he was just always talking about the Lord and bless the Lord and praise the Lord and and all of these things. And man, he seemed like he was just legitimately on fire. And he brought his laptop one day to work and he said, I'm having a problem with this thing. He said, I said, uh, I said is it yours? He, uh, he said, yeah. He said, my wife got it for me for Christmas a couple of years ago or whatever. And I said, well, he said, I downloaded it, but it didn't install. And I said, well, let's see. And I'm moving through it real quick to see where it might have downloaded. All of a sudden, this folder popped up and it didn't show everything, but it was these little icons and all of a sudden, like, I could tell that there was something that there's things that I'm not wanting to look at in here. And there's lots of, and I, and he goes, oh, oh, he just did like that. And I hurried up and I hit X and I just kept going through there. I prayed for that guy. He had, he had a heart attack a week later. He was fine. But I never spoke to him about it. I'd only know the, knew the guy a month and just from coming in the office and he was at the front desk. And I remember after that happened, I thought, God, he's supposed to be in church. Now, does that mean that, my goodness, we're going to banish people if they're, no, Kirk Franklin actually had a, 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 he said during a lot of the times where God was, putting songs to him, he, he had a, an issue with pornography and he came out about it later that I used to have an issue with this stuff while I was in the ministry. There's things that people are battling. I'm not saying that I'm gonna condemn everybody and they're going to hell and they're not worth anything. No, people are always battling something. But I'm not condoning it either. Wrong is wrong, amen? But I felt so bad because I never said anything. I had a week to say something from that moment. Man, I don't know how I would have felt if he had died. No contact. They, uh, it, 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 his records were you know, closed. He couldn't get anything. They said he was fine. And, and I, I prayed for him. I said, Lord, turn him around. This guy, he was in his 60s. What kind of character do we have? I want the letter A. What is that called? It's called a what? Anybody know? A character. Right? What about a number? The number two. It's a what? A character. You ever heard that? You go to insert, a, you go to your bank and it'll say, please create a, a password. It must contain eight characters. Why? You know why A is called a character? Because it's always an A. A B is always a B. A four is always a four. It doesn't change. What does our character say about us? I want to be real. This message is not meant to beat you down. Anybody in here still developing? I am. I 
I want to develop Tyler's character. I don't want him to go through all the things that I had to go through. Amen? All right, let me preach this message. <laughs> I already went through some of this, so I ain't going to stay on it too long. Genesis 1.26, I got about 10 minutes, and I'm going to wrap up. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Dominion is what? Power and authority. Character is so important that he gave character before he gave power. Image, likeness, then dominion. God will never give you power until you have developed character. He, he showed that principle right here, did he not? Give them image, give them likeness, now let them have dominion. Because when you have power, when you are put into authority, who you really are will begin to show. You give somebody a bunch of money, guess what's going to happen? Their character is going to come out. It's true. Sometimes we're wondering, why is God not giving me, you know, power and authority and different things that we're praying for? And, and, and it may be that we're not developed enough. We don't have the character. Sometimes people rush into ministry so fast, but they don't have the character to sustain them when they get there. Mark 4, 30, 30, 30 through 32. And he said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? I read this last time, so I'm just reviewing this real quick. It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. No matter how small you feel like you started, if you're one of his, you're going to grow. You're going to become the largest in the garden. And look, the birds were attracted to what? The shadow. Fruit, what are we attracted to when we see a tree? We're attracted to that fruit because it looks beautiful. Who are we attracting? All right, that's enough of you. Let me give you... Some new stuff that I, actually I was writing a few notes just today because I didn't get to finish this. <clears throat> the word holy. I want you to think about this. Deuteronomy 6, 4. King James says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In the NIV, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. The root word for holy, the root word, guess what it is? One. The root word for holy is one. Sometimes we're seeking holiness. We're seeking to be holy. But holy means you are one. If you are multiple people, depending on who you talk to, there's a holiness issue. Holy means one. Are we one? I've always said I don't trust people that have never been tested. Somebody that's been through it and they're still standing, they get a lot of respect because they've been through it and they're still trusting him. Trials will bring out who you are. Give me five minutes. You know, sometimes uh, I, I, I've, when, whenever I pastored a church years ago and we had 
there was always just somebody that would come in off the street and they're ready to preach. You ever had that? And they quack like a duck. They, they walk like a duck. And But there's something, something just not. And sometimes people may come in to this ministry and they say, man, I want to. I want to teach, I want to do this, and, and they want to be put into a position of authority immediately. But look at this, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. You should know them that labor among you. That's why Roy protected this pulpit so much, because he needed to know you. There is nothing so precious as somebody's trust. There's nothing that's harder to earn than trust when you've violated it. Amen? I'm going to read you one last thing. Write this down somewhere. The foundation of trust is integrity. Foundation of trust is integrity. We're talking about character. When we talk about character, we're talking about integrity. We're talking about being the same person all the time. There are so many people that are, th- th- their character is still developing, but they are going after, developing after other people rather than the word. Listen to me. No matter what you think about me, don't ever do something because I do it. Don't listen to me because just because I said it. You need to make sure that what I say lines up with the word because if anybody ever was to try to follow after me, guess what? I can get off on the wrong path. But the word is what? constant and it never changes we've got so many people in this world that are saying they're christians but the problem is is they're following after whoever they followed before and they never got in the word we need that consistency that definition of character that definition of holiness Because man's definition will change as time goes on and it gets freer and freer and freer. And now it seems like you can point to a scripture and say, this says clearly that this is wrong, but people don't care because so-and-so says they're a Christian and they do it. I'm ready to see God begin to move again. And guess who he's going to move through? Those that are one. And realize when I'm saying this stuff, I'm not speaking directly to you. We got people on the internet that are watching this. This message might be for somebody that watches this two years from now. But it'll still be valid. Amen. I want you to see this story of character development. I don't have the, I've got the scriptures here that I'm going to read. Anybody know who this is? Huh? That's easy, isn't it? I'm going to be reading this from 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 51, and then we're going to close. <clears throat> now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shokah, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shokah and Azekah and Ephesdom 
And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had an helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul and the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle and the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn and next unto him Abinadab and the third Shammah and David was the youngest and the three eldest followed Saul But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp of thy brethren. You may think that you're not in a place to grow. You may think that everything is just... but you never know that what you're doing is going to lead you into who you're going to become never think that what you are currently doing is beneath you or not taking you somewhere God is always developing you does that sound like somebody who's getting ready to start their path on becoming a king Here, take this to your brothers. He was bringing them what? Food. And carry these 10 cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him saying, 
What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Know who you are. It would be easy for us to say, I'm one man, I'm one woman. He said, who is this that defies the armies of the living God? You, when you go out and do the, when you leave this building tonight, you are not alone if he is with you. You, you have an entire kingdom behind you. Amen. I'm never alone. That's encouraging. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, so shall it be done to that man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And the, Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Sometimes on your road, when God's developing your character, there's going to be people trying to put you in a place. He had been tending the sheep. None of that changes who he's going to be. Amen? Sometimes we think when we... Because there's something, there's a vision in our mind and sometimes we have a vision of how it should be unfolded. And if it doesn't unfold the way we think it should, we begin to doubt and we doubt ourselves. Don't have faith in a certain execution of a vision. Have faith in the vision that God's going to get you there. Let the execution happen. God will make it happen. Amen. Sometimes we doubt because it didn't happen the way we wanted it to. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Even those you love may be against you. But don't let that change anything. He, this boy that they are putting down, he was going to become the greatest king Israel has seen. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner and the people answered him again in the, after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for thou art but a youth and he a man of war from his youth. On your road of developing character and God bringing you into who you are, there's going to be people that are going to tell you you're not ready. You don't have the skills. They're going to give you every reason why this cannot be done. If God has sent you, success is inevitable. Amen? And David said unto Saul, is this encouraging to anybody? And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. <laughs> and Saul armed David with his armor 
And he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. There may be standards that man has established that are norms for success. And what God brings you into, man, I feel this. What God brings you into and the environment he brings you into, it may not be textbook. It may seem odd. But if it's God behind you, it don't matter. And he took his staff in his hand and chose chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine come on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and and, and ruddy and and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand and I will smite thee. Do y'all notice a trend here? You've got to speak stuff before it happens. If you really believe it, you need to begin to speak it. If there's something you need in your life and you've been waiting on it, maybe God's waiting for you to speak it into existence. Whatever's in the invisible, begin to bring it in the visible. Don't wait for a sign. Don't wait for something to happen. Don't wait to see money in your account before you make plans to build something, to start something. Whatever it is that God has shown you a vision, I don't care if the resources are there. I don't care if the people are backing you. If God has said it's going to happen, let it happen. Trust him. He is the source. Why do we look at resources when he's the source? He's the source of the resources. Man, people will laugh at you. Here's a man going to fight a war against a man of war. A boy going to fight a war against a man of war. What has he got? Five rocks. (laughs) It may not look like you are ready. It may not look like you are ready. Come on. It may not look like where you're going. It may not look like you are prepared to get there with what you got. But if God has given you what you have and he's given you a vision, by God, you're going. Hmm. Let me finish this. I went over 15 minutes. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. (laughs) For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistines arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. 
So David prepared, prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. The very thing that the enemy will try to use against you to destroy you will become a weapon against him. How can we lose if God is for us? You know how? When we get in the way, when we don't trust him, when we begin to doubt ourselves, when we doubt ourselves, you know what we're doing? We're doubting what God has made. You're reading the word, you're praying, you're fasting, you're seeking him. You're putting his kingdom first, righteousness first. Let everything else fall into place. Amen? Y'all stand with me. Is this good? Anybody feel encouraged? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Say, Lord, use me. I want you just to raise your hands right now and tell them this. Say, Lord, I am made in your image after your likeness. Lord, everything in my life that it is not supposed to be there Remove it from my life. Lord, reveal things that should be cast away that are not fruitful for me. Open my eyes so that I will see. Lord, remove all hindrances. I don't want anything in between me and you. Use me, God. Everybody lift your hands up real high. Say, Lord, anoint my hands to do your work. Wrought special miracles. Bring healing through my hands as a sign that I'm a believer because it says in your word, that these signs shall follow. Lord, let sickness be removed from this church. Let all of those that are a part of this church be healed. Let their bodies begin to mend right now. We speak healing. They will be restored. They will be restrengthened. They will be rejuvenated in the name of Jesus. And any weapon that the enemy has tried to use upon us, your people, Lord, let it be used against him in the name of Jesus. What the enemy would use for tragedy let it become a triumph in Jesus' name. Praise God. Thank you guys for your time, for your extra time. I went over 20 minutes. I hope it was good. Thank you for sharing your time with me and allowing me to share some of my time with you. Find somebody and love them. God bless you. Ronnie, will you put something on?